uh, we will today be talking about navigating the broken referral process and how we can improve uh, your referral conversion. Uh, we will start off with uh, intros. So there's uh, going to be two speakers today. There's myself. I'm Tashri Nekram, Chief Medical Officer at Luma Health. Um, and joining me is Bill, and I'll let him do a quick intro on his part. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Hamsh. I am the CEO and Practice Administrator for an OBGYN practice in Tallahassee, North Florida Women's Care. Um, I also serve on the board uh, for Medical Group Management Association. Um, we are located uh, in Tallahassee uh, with 10 physicians and four nurse practitioners, a very busy and successful practice. Um, and I'm delighted to be here uh, on this call with everybody today. Perfect, thank you. And Tashveen, if you would uh, launch us off with the agenda. Yeah. That's great. So what we'll do is we'll sort of lay the ground and talk about what the referral problem is. And I think this probably is not lost on a lot of people, but I think it's good to kind of lay the ground. And then we'll talk about some of the granular aspects of what the referral problem is, both looking at it from the patient side and also from the clinic side. And then we'll launch into a few things that you uh, as referring and referred providers can do today to help smooth out that referral process. Um, and then we'll finish off talking a little bit about how um, actually improving your referral process can be rewarding to you, not only from your practice, um, from the standpoint of revenue and being able to generate uh, better health outcomes, but also uh, it's actually a mandate from the government. And then we'll open up for question and answers. Um, just as a logistic, uh, we will be taking questions, but we will uh, address all your questions at the end. So go ahead, you can use the chat Q&A box on the, on the bottom left corner. Um, go ahead and send them through. And then at the end, we will uh, address your questions. So I wanted to first start talking off, talking, start off by talking about referral stats. But before getting into that, I will let Bill kind of set the grounds to see to help you understand why the referral process is important for your practice. Great, thank you. You know, setting the stage, I want to start with that I am just like many of you. I'm a decision maker and responsible for managing the practice, and I can't emphasize enough of the importance um, and the challenges that we face with referrals. Uh, from primary care or other physicians in the community. Um, you know, we, we are um, tracking our, new, our sources of new patients, and believe it or not, our number one source of these are from referring physicians. It used to be friends and family, but for some reason lately it's tipped uh, to referring physicians. Um, and there are some significant dollars linked to these patients. And I have to find ways to improve our workflows uh, while keeping physicians and patients happy, or I could lose patients and it also in turns to significant dollars. And we re in my practice, we receive referrals in many ways, including fax, phone, mail, um, and our local RIN uh, for communication into our practice. And we don't always get the complete information needed uh, to schedule the patient, so there's a lot of barriers and challenges that we face just in the communication piece uh, from those referring physicians. Um, and also, some of our physicians are very popular and have very few slots for new patients. And you know, we, we want to make sure we take care of these patients timely. Um, so we have to do what we can to work with the system to get the patients scheduled you know, quickly. Uh, so Tashreen, if you would, please just um, share some of the statistics that you have. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, I, I looked across a few different uh, literature sources, and I think these were the, some of the most uh, eye-opening statistics around some of the referral process and some of the challenges. The top one is probably the most important one, which is that between 60 to 70 percent of referrals go unscheduled. Um, and as, as a physician, to me, that is a, is a huge loss of opportunity. It's, it correlates directly with poor health outcomes. There's a lot of challenges why that is such a high number. Now, it does vary a little bit across specialties and regions, but um, when we work with several different clinics across the U.S., we see that the, the unconverted referral rate is quite high, and even they have better performing clinics, it's hard for them to break through 50%. Now, so that's just the kind of the top of the funnel. Even if you do uh, are able to get in touch with the patient and able to schedule the patient, unfortunately, a significant portion of those patients still do not show up for the appointment. So statistic that I found, um, some of the literature was, uh, the number revolved around 25%. And again, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, some of it has to do with the fact that oftentimes these 
patients are scheduled quite far in advance and the patient doesn't unfortunately show up. Now going on to the other side, which is a communication problem. Um, a lot of primary care physicians don't like the referral process and, and it boils down to the fact that they're kind of in the, in the loss of what's going on. Um, they refer their patient to a specialist and have no idea what's going on with that patient. And that's one of the biggest pain points that we hear from primary care doctors or patient or, or doctors are referring um, a lot of patients to specialists. And you kind of hear actually the same thing on the reverse side on specialists. When, when a patient shows up into their clinic, they've been scheduled for a referral from the primary care doctor. They're also kind of in the loss of why this patient is. And unfortunately, sometimes that's left up to the patient to communicate why they are here. And that's not always the best way to practice um, kind of the referral process. Um, what's also really interesting is that uh, in the last decade, we've seen referrals go up and it doesn't look like this is going to change. So um, referral, you're going to be starting seeing more and more referrals. And as Bill mentioned, it's going to become more of an important source for specialists in terms of growing your business and making sure that you, your patient base grows. And one final point of why the referral process is painful is because a lot of it's, it's paper driven. Um, and this was a quite large number start about a number of forms providers fill out 20,000 forms. And because uh, a lot of the referral processes are still manual and paper driven, it becomes a very unfulfilling process for providers because it's just another paperwork to add to their, um, uh, to their workflow. Now the referral process is not just problematic for small practices, but it's also problematic for large healthcare systems. Um, there's a paper published by Brigham's and Women's Hospital about two years ago where they started to look at their referral process and try to dissect it to figure out um, what was the problem. And before they started to really solve the problems, they did a survey and they found that 63% of primary care doctors were dissatisfied with the referral process. And because of that dissatisfaction, they had saw 40% of their patients leaving the system. Now to put it in perspective, Brigham's uh, Brigham Women's and Health Hospital offers a wide variety of specialties, so all these patients could have been potentially served within their system. And if you imagine from just a loss of revenue, 40% of your patients leaving your system is, 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 is quite a significant loss. Going to the other coast from Boston to San Francisco, this problem again was, was present. San Francisco General Hospital is a public safety network hospital, um, and they also had a very um, problematic process in terms of getting referrals uh, being seen. I and mean, as you can see here, they had very, very long wait times, um, anywhere ranging from 11 months for a GI to seven months for endocrinology. Now, this is probably a little bit on the extreme in terms of trying to get a new patient in, but suffice it to say that large healthcare systems also have a problem. And interestingly enough, they implemented an electronic referral system, and they were able to get that, uh, that number down to on the order of a few weeks. So the hope, the, 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 the light in the, in the end of the tunnel is that there is hope to be able to, um, if, we, if we put in the right process to correct the uh, referral process, but it definitely is a challenge. Um, I'll hand it off to Bill here to see if he, uh, he can add a little bit more uh, light onto what his experience is around some of these statistics. Um, I don't have my own specific quantifiable statistic of how many we're getting or how many we are not being able to get seen, but I can tell you our three greatest challenges. Uh, the first one is patient compliance. You know, basically getting that patient on the schedule and in the door to be seen by one of our uh, providers, that is probably our number one challenge that we face. Secondly is getting the um, adequate and timely documentation from the referring physician. We have many challenges of you know, not having the diagnosis or some of the records that we need to see. You know, and third is finding space in a timely fashion on a particular provider's schedule to get them seen pretty quickly. And you know, we have uh, some physicians in the community that have relationships with certain physicians in our practice. And you know, and some of our physicians, you know, they have uh, availability within a day or two, but the other ones could be several months. And you know, some of these patients um, need to be seen fairly quick depending on the situation. So you know, it definitely is a challenge to make sure we have adequate space on the schedule. And we always analyze whether or not we need to add you know, new physicians you know, to our, um, our panel just to accommodate these referring patients. Perfect, that's great. Um, Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about um, just overall uh, what, how the referral process is broken and then we'll kind of launch into looking at it from different aspects from the patient and the, and the clinic aspect? 
Sure, absolutely. The, the, the process is definitely broken, and you can kind of break it down into two sides, both from the patient side and also from the practice. Um, but in general, as many of you know, this process is very manual. In my practice, we have one person's entire job dedicated to all the referrals that come into our practice. We also have another dedicated full-time staff person that handles all the referrals out of our practice, many times for radiology or imaging services, but lots of times to other specialties. Um, and so you know, having all these individuals that are responsible for this is very costly to the practice, not to mention there's risks for things kind of falling through the gap. Um, and some of the challenges you know, that we all face are that the patients may not be engaged. Um, they don't know who we are. Uh, many times they don't even understand why they're coming in. There may be some barriers due to dollars. You know, some plans you know, have high co-pays or out-of-pocket expenses with that. Um, and then obviously within a specialty practice, the co-pays are significantly more than a primary care practice. Um, <clears throat> the communication between the providers is always going to be an issue until we're all connected electronically. Um, there's barriers to connecting through the phone. Even getting through to someone live on the phone system um, is always a challenge. You know, when we're trying to contact them uh, to get, you know, the diagnosis or some records that are missing, you know, and the patient's either here or on their way to the appointment, and we don't have what we need. So there's some challenges that are faced with current technology, you know, with using phones uh, to be able to get what we need. And then, um, you know, definitely getting the patients involved. There's just so many aspects of this that end up causing a delay within the care that's needed. And sometimes, you know, if the patient's in pain or they're bleeding, they don't have time to wait. And that could be um, a risk or a safety factor for the patients, um, not to mention the satisfaction issue. You know, and one other thing I would like to point out is, I am so removed from the daily workflow process for these referring uh, patients coming in and out of the practice. It's very important, you know, that you're involved in this process from the very beginning. You know, many times I don't know about things until they're a problem and it's too late. So it's important to review your workflows and your process and to ask questions to make sure you understand where the challenges or the barriers are in this entire process, and maybe you can make some suggestions or improvements in that process. And, and looking at it from the patient side, um, I think Bill touched upon some of this, but there are definitely some significant problems or hurdles for a patient to be able to uh, get through from one end to the other. Um, I think it, one of it, it, it starts off that the patient will have a unique relationship with their primary care doctor. And for some patients, that may be the only doctor. And the moment that that primary care doctor decides to refer the patient out to a different physician, um, I think that, that unfamiliarity and that um, new territory that the patient has to kind of cross over can, can be a little bit frightening for patients. And that definitely becomes a hurdle in terms of getting that patient converted into a, a patient for that uh, specialist. And some of that relates to the second bullet point, which is low health literacy. Of course, this problem is more pervasive than just a referral um, issue, but patients, uh, especially patients in, in the U.S. in certain geographic areas, have a very difficult time grasping um, what their medical condition is. Um, and I think some of that relates to the fact that a lot of our physicians um, have, low, uh, have short blocks of time for patients, um, and there's a lot of ground to cover, and so they don't have the resources or the time to be able to explain um, what's going on with the patient and why it might be important for that patient to make sure that they're seen by that referral, by, by seen by that, excuse me, that specialist. And so um, patients are kind of in the loss because now they're being referred to a new doctor and they're not even sure why they have to go see that doctor. Um, the second issue, or the third issue is, is, is around scheduling. Um, let's just say, assume the patient is engaged and they're, they're interested in, in having this uh, issue solved. Um, and they call up that specialist, but then they find out that the nearest appointment is several weeks or several months out of the way. This can be a significant deterrent because the patient is, is engaged, the patient is interested in, in having their issue addressed, but now they're told that they can't have it addressed 
for another few to se- few weeks to several months. And that what that conveys to the patient is that perhaps it's not as an urgent issue as maybe the primary care doctor had, had made it out to be. And final, and Bill had t- touched upon this a little bit, but healthcare is, is very complicated enough. And the finance part is just as another layer of complication. And the moment you mention referral to a specialist to any patient, the first thing that occurs to them is how much is this going to cost me? And unfortunately, the, the way the billing system works in our system, uh, we're not able to really give a clear idea to the patient of how much it's actually going to cost. Obviously, they have the upfront cost of the co-pays, but uh, the eventual cost that may, um, the patient may pay out of pocket um, is, is entirely unknown, not only to the patient, but also the provider. And, and given the recent trends of rising deductibles, that becomes, a, that becomes even a sig- more significant challenge as more of the financial burden is pushed onto the patient. You know, if I could uh, add a couple stories that, on a point that you talked about with the low health literacy. Um, we have examples of where a patient is referred to us for an issue by the physician, but the patient thought the reason why they were referred to was for a different reason. Uh, She had, you know, pelvic pain, and the physician had referred the patient to us because of an irregular bleeding. So there was a a breakdown of why the patient was in the office. Um, Another story is um, a patient was referred to us from her primary for a colposcopy, and this patient has never seen a gynecologist in the past. She's, you know, a young girl and just had an abnormal pap smear, so she didn't know what this procedure was, and Honestly, she thought she was coming here because she thought she had cancer or she was having a, a screening for a cancer test, um, but she had some dysplasia with her uh, with cervical um, uh, polyps. So it was uh, interesting that, you know, there is this literacy issue as they're not familiar with our lingo and our, our industry of language of why they're coming here, what we even do as a specialist. Yeah, no, that's perfect for the anecdotes. Um, now, switching gears to uh, some of the processes that are uh, the referral process from a, the clinic standpoint. Bill, do you want to talk a little bit more about this? I think you have a, you're kind of in the. Yeah. Um, definitely, the the practice. You know, the the main tool that we use to communicate with patients. You know, currently is a phone call, and you know many patients now use their cell phones, and sometimes there are issues with the phone. Um, either having blocked calls or the, the voicemail isn't set up or it's full and you can't get through to that person. But as in many of your communities, I'm sure you have those random phone calls that may even be from a local phone number, thinking it's someone that you know that just hasn't been set up in your phone, um, only to find out that this is some sales robocall. Um, so now, if I don't recognize the phone number, I don't even answer my phone. Uh, um, and so lots of times if it's a legitimate call, they'll end up going to my voicemail um, and then having to play phone tag with that. So patients typically may not pick up the phone if it's a brand new relationship with your practice because they don't recognize you know, that phone number. Then secondly, you know, there's only so much you can do to continually track you know, that patient to make sure that they get scheduled. You know, we have a system in place that we, we text patients and after the fifth text message, if they have not responded back to us, we close that referral down and we notify the referring physician that we were not able to schedule that patient. Um, you know, and then there's always the documentation to, that you show that you prove that you did try to reach, reach the patient. So you have to have you know, some tools in place to document that in the patient's chart if you even have a chart created for someone that hasn't even been seen yet. So there's a lot of issues with trying to come up with an organized system to track and make sure you get these patients on the schedule. And as I mentioned before, there are lots of challenges faced with trying to connect your practice to other practices unless you have, um, if you're all on the same system, um, if you're in a multi-specialty practice, it may be a little bit easier, but in most of our practices, we may need to connect with the doctor outside of our group, and so there's some challenges with that. You know, and unfortunately, if the wait time for the patients to get actually seen, they may either decide not to get the care or they may go somewhere else to a practice who can, and that's happened many times in my practice uh, due to some barrier that they could not get on the schedule right away. Perfect, great. 
now jumping into what we can do about this, we've, we've covered a little bit of ground on what the problems are, both from the patient side and from the clinic side. But, so what can we do? Um, I think on the patient side, it's all about patient engagement and, and getting the patient interested in their health, um, helping them understand why it's important for them to be engaged in their health will, will be a definite catalyst in making sure that these referrals actually convert into patients into your clinic. So the top of the funnel would be addressing that low uh, patient health literacy. Patients, as we mentioned, have a difficult time understanding what their condition is, what needs to be done. Um, and a lot of these, with these, a lot of these chronic conditions, sometimes the complications of them are several years down the line. And so for a patient who has, for example, diabetes today, they might not see any impact from it for another few, several years. And so being able to convince the patient that they need to be engaged in their health right now is really important. Um, so there's kind of two things specifically on the front of referrals that we can do with this. The first is physicians are, are often overworked and don't have the ability to be able to spend extra time with their patients to explain why it's important to go see the referral. So I think this is where we can leverage um, some of, our, uh, of, of the other staff in the, in the clinic. So whether that would be the nurse or the front scheduling staff and being able to help them become versed in why it's important for them to be able to, for the patient to follow up with the referral and being, ha making them available. So for example, when the patient is walking out of the, the exam room and, and going to schedule their follow-up appointment with their PCT, having the front desk staff have a script that says, it looks like you've been referred to such and such physician or such and such practice. Is there anything I can help with that? Is there, are there any concerns you have? You know, do you have any questions I can help answer? And, and related to that, on the actual specialist side, uh, being able to create content on your website that addresses the most common reasons um, that patients are referred to you. Um, Patients, when they get referred or when they're about to go see a new doctor, will jump on to Google and look you up. Well, they'll, and they'll find you on Yelp, but they'll also find your website, your clinic website. And it's important to make sure that you have content that's very friendly, that is patient-focused, and addresses the common questions. And, and it helps the patients understand why it's important for them to be able to follow up um, and, and convert uh, into a patient for that practice. Jumping down uh, to the next bullet is on scheduling. Um, probably the, one of the most common complaints we see from uh, our, uh, the patients that, we, that, are, uh, that work with our clinics is that it's tough to get in. Um, most clinics have dedicated times for new appointments um, and new referrals. And unfortunately, just the way the schedules work, those are many, many weeks out. Um, so one of the most discouraging things that can be for a patient is that uh, you're interested in getting it, you're into the clinic, but you're told you can't be seen for two months or worse, you know, few, uh, more months than that. So being able to adjust and be flexible in your schedule and allowing patients to be able to take control of their, of, of, of their own scheduling. Um, and that has two benefits. One is that a patient will be more engaged and feel like they're more in control of their health. And two is that it takes off an extra burden. And, you know, there's a lot of different solutions out there that can help you have granular control of your schedule so that the patient doesn't have complete control of it. But I think that's a, it's an it's a easy step uh, um, allowing patients to be more engaged. Um, the next thing would be is uh, not relying on the patient to convey um, the reason for the referral. And Bill kind of touched upon this where the patient showed up in the clinic and had no idea why they were actually referred. And really that reflects unfortunately poorly on, on the primary care doctor if they haven't effectively conveyed that information to the referring doctor. And also it reflects poorly upon the referring doctor because the, the, the specialist will not know what to do. And I'll, I'll kind of stop off that before we jump into the um, some of the solutions of what we can do uh, on the clinic side and see if Bill has any um, extra light he can shed on this. Um, I, I read a statistic once that basically four out of five patients do go online to research their health, maybe the health problems or providers. And, and I would recommend, you know, monitoring your website as this is the primary tool, but there's also social media aspects um, to make sure that your website is fresh with new content, that it's not outdated, that there are you know, providers that may or may not still be with the practice on there or new ones that are coming on um, because that is basically the first impression that patients have to you before they even call. They're actually going online and checking you out. Um, and you know, if you don't have the resources or the staff to do that, you can um, look within your own community. If you have a university, there's a lot of uh, um, students that are in a major for marketing, maybe even health uh, management that could take on a project to help either customize or update and refresh your, your website. 
and taking consideration the fact that many people nowadays are using um, computers that are not a typical standard to computer or desktop. They're using tablets or mobile devices and making sure that your website is mobile friendly is key to that. Um, in our community we also have, um, with the language barrier, we have a high population of Spanish speaking individuals and we don't have staff that are all fluent in Spanish. Um, there are vendors out there that have language solutions that you can just pick up a phone and call them and they can speak within seconds on over 700 different languages that are out there. And we do that uh, for our schedulers also while they are in the exam room with the uh, physician and the nurse. Well, we typically don't rely on the patient's family members as there may be some challenges with communicating specific clinical information. So we typically always use these. And you can use a cell phone and call the phone line and then um, have that language interpreted into whatever language that they speak. Um, and, you know, and I'd like to just add in general that you need to give patients some solutions to help them connect and communicate. It is a must you know, in today's society. And there are several technology solutions to improve the whole patient experience and their satisfaction. Um, you know, and, and I would even identify you know, different things as far as there's so many things to do. I would identify what the need is the greatest first and focus on that, perfect it, and then focus on the next thing. Otherwise, you get overwhelmed pretty quick. Um, and the last point I'd like to make is you had commented earlier about the um, having some frequently asked questions on your website. Interview different staff, whether it's the uh, folks down in your uh, appointment scheduling or call center or even your triage nurses uh, or check in, check out. There's a lot of wealth within your own population of employees to kind of help drive some of those many phone calls that they come to, to ask you on, on a telephone call onto the website for different aspects of your practice. So I think that pretty much covers you know, just in general uh, recommendations I have for that. But there <coughs> are many other solutions out there too. So um, just take it slowly and, and one project at a time. No, that, that's great. Yeah, that, getting practical advice is, is definitely the way to go. Um, we're running a little bit low on time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to uh, one of the second slides on how, what we as as what we can recommend to the clinics and trying to smooth out some of this referral process. And I think a lot of it will revolve on communication. And, and I think on this, it's it's better to say that the more communication there is, the better you are off. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, referral processes break down because of lack of communication between both the uh, referring doctor and the specialist. Um, so. One of the things that we've seen work really well between, um, to smooth out this process is upfront setting up expectations between the primary care doctor or the referring doctor and the specialist. Um, and this can help to set the ground and to help to understand what is expected on both sides. Um, one of the most frustrating things for as a patient is that if you get referred to a provider, you get referred to a specialist and they make certain recommendation and then you go back, back to your primary care doctor and he, just, he or she decides to overturn that. So I think Amongst the things that you can uh, agree upon between you as a specialist and the primary care doctor is that who in the end will be making the final decision. And what the problem is if that is not set up in place, that also um, will drive confusion for the patient and, and drive low patient engagement. And so if there's a, if, if up front, what's important is to be able to say, hey, as a, as a specialist, I will be making a recommendation to you as a patient, but ultimately who will be driving the decision will be the primary care doctor. And what that does is that makes sure that everyone's on the same page and that the patient is not confused. Amongst the other things that setting expectations is turnaround time. And that revolves around how soon, if I refer my patient to you, the specialist, can you get my patient into the door? Um, and I think setting guidelines um, around that can not only help you as a primary care doctor set expectations of the patient when you're saying, okay, this doctor will be able to get you in a few weeks, but also make sure that the, the concern is addressed for the patient. And then again, communication. Communication is a key, making sure that what is expected. So when you are sending a referral in, what are the key elements um, that the specialist wants to see? And then once the referral is completed, what are the key elements that need to be sent back to the primary care doctor? And it's not just also about uh, communicating about when a referral is completed. It's also about, as Bill was mentioning, when a referral is not completed, because that is actually 
equally valuable information for the primary care doctor because then they can know that, that the issue has not been resolved and either they need to resolve it themselves or find another avenue to resolve it. The other thing that's really important for specialists is that they want to be able to see patients that they feel comfortable in treating. So understanding what are the disease entities or problems that they're willing to address and what are not. And again, this is also, we'll come back to your patient frustration, because if you get referred, you as a patient get referred to a specialist and that specialist is not able to address your issue, that, and then the, and the specialist tells you, well, I'm going to refer you to a second physician, that, as you can imagine, can be quite frustrating for the patient. And we've seen some, and so these are some things that are setting the expectations between um, a specialist and primary care doctor. We've seen sometimes that the expectations will actually be written down. Um, and that's probably not uh, a necessity, but what, what, what's helpful in that if, that, if the relationship ever goes sour, if there's any ever communication, or if there's, sorry, if there's any um, disagreement, you have it written down, and there's a, a kind of a document um, that you can refer to saying, you know, this is what we agreed upon um, to sort of smooth that pro uh, process out if there's ever any, ever any uh, disagreement. Kind of going down to the next bullet point, um, and Bill touched upon this, that a lot of our referral processes are manually driven or paper driven. And so making them as electronic as possible will, will help you leap and beyond, go beyond um, what the current referral process is. Um, and uh, I will kind of uh, stop off with the last two points, which is um, oftentimes, well not oftentimes, but sometimes the primary care doctors, when they're referring, um, having, giving them the flexibility of, of allowing them to identify patients that are higher risk or higher priority and saying, hey, look, so our standard process is that we'll get you within two weeks, but we have few open slots on a regular basis that we can get patients in within three days. This will, this will, this will make the referral process a lot easier and a lot less painful for the primary care doctors because um, they will often come across patients that need to be seen on a more short-term basis, and giving them that option um, is, is really important for them. And finally, um, this is more a, a, a kind of a side service that uh, – we found that works well for primary care doctors and keeping them engaged and being able to offer what we call a curbside referral. Um, oftentimes, uh, a primary care doctor may have a simple question that they need to address. They might be very comfortable in taking care of patients who have high blood pressure, but there may be a particular medication or they're trying to do a, a slight dose adjustment, or there may be a particular question that they have. And rather creating a whole referral out of it, um, if they're able to give the specialist a phone call and say, hey, look, I just have a quick question you know, rather than me sending you this patient and doing a formal evaluation, can you just help me with this one question? And again, this goes, this, this in terms of um, nurturing that relationship with the primary care doctor can go a long way. I'll let Bill jump in um, if he has any yeah. other experts. Just, just a quick thing. Um, to me, it's important to allocate time to spend building the relationship with the referring physicians. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, webinar, it is our number one source of new patients, and you need to have a good relationship with that physician. And their reputation is on the line if a patient that we mutually share has a bad experience. So building um, or improving any of the challenges that they've identified in referring to you early on is important. Go out, talk to them, take them a small tray of cookies, but not only talk to the referring provider, I would also encourage you to talk to the support staff. Many times it's the nurses or even clerical staff that are the processor to get that patient referred to you. Talk to those individuals um, and find out if there are any challenges that they face. And definitely, definitely, um, you know, make sure that you do close that loop if there is a patient that's seen or not seen that you know, notify them whether it's in a letter, an office visit, or a phone call, some way to make sure that their patients aren't left hanging without communicating back to that referring physician. Great. So we're going to jump to our last line and kind of close it off. So obviously nurturing your referral business um, is not only good for growing your practice, um, it's also good for improving health outcomes and patient engagement, but the CMS also sees this as an important process that's been broken and actually rewards you for it. And so there's a quality metric around making sure you close the, re close the referral loop by making sure that the note or the progress note is sent back to the primary care doctor. So there's a quality metric around that and there's actually an improvement activity around that. And I think this just kind of also underlines the importance that 
as a healthcare system, um, there's a lot of poor outcomes that can be attributed um, to a poor referral process. So I think it behooves us not only to um, give it some attention to drive business, to drive our uh, patients to our door, but also drive health outcomes. And finally, also the government will actually reward you for doing these processes. And yeah, that, I want to add that um, many people keep saying that healthcare is changing, healthcare is changing. I actually disagree with that. I feel that healthcare has changed. It has already arrived. Value-based medicine is more important now than ever, and you can choose to either be proactive or reactive, and this is one of the aspects that you can focus on to improve your outcomes, your health outcomes, and also um, meet some measures with the regulations. So we're going to uh, open it up for questions. Um, there are a few questions here. I'm going to give uh, maybe a few seconds for anyone to send in some uh, few last questions. And then we are kind of running low on time, so we're going to have to filter through our questions a little bit. So we have a question here um, on what is the uh, – and I, I think this probably uh, is, is a question for – Bill, what have you seen as the, has had the best impact in improving your conversion rate? And I think the question is going to get around um, what, have, what have you seen best work in your practice and improve your referral conversion rate for inbound referrals? That's easy. Without a doubt, I would say technology. Um, you have to leverage technology to make processes less cumbersome, more efficient, um, and to be able to accommodate today's demands, many patients, um, like many of us, have uh, made a, um, a, a airline arrangements um, or any kind of travel arrangements online. And this is where everybody is comfortable in today's world. It's not just for a small sum. And leveraging that technology in ways to communicate with patients in other ways in your traditional methods of phone call um, are important to adopt. And I would suggest that's where you start. That is a good place to improve um, some of those outcomes in the conversion. Um, and definitely just understand your workflow. You know, find ways you may be surprised of some, even the language in the documents that may be outdated or can be improved. Um, and lastly, I would say is just to build a um, expectation with your referring physicians as far as when those patients can get scheduled. They want their patients seen right away and finding ways to improve the schedule to allow time for those patients to get worked in timely would be, would be a great way to start. Great. We'll take one more question because I find this question interesting and I'd love to hear what, um, some of Bill's comments are on that. If you have a referring provider, um, and they've been a consistent provider, a con consistent referring to your clinic, and now you've seen them sort of drop off. Do you have any advice on how to re-engage them and how you can get their business back into your clinic? Well, it does seem like there may be uh, some factors that have changed that. It could be the support staff within their own organization. Maybe it's not the physician. It could be uh, someone in their office that may have a relationship with another same specialty person in the community, um, I would definitely feel that it's very important to identify if you see a trend and that they're dropping off, you need to approach that particular physician's office um, and find out what happened to make sure there wasn't anything. They could have had one bad outcome and they could have generalized that to be their entire population of referring patients. So talk to the provider and, and their staff and to see um, you know, what the issue is Make sure they understand that they are very important. Their patients are, you know, important to get seen pretty quickly. You can even send a simple letter out to all your medical community that do refer patients to you and just say, we are here for you. We want to get your patients seen as quickly as possible and maybe have a physician or provider backline, uh, different tools that you can make to make the process easier for them. And that may be the reason why the trend has dropped. Great. That was great. Um, well, I think with that, we will go ahead and close out the webinar. I wanted to thank everyone um, for joining. Uh, if you did sign up, 
we will be sending you uh, a brief email um, if, so in case you have any follow-up questions, and we'll have these slides attached. And we'll also um, add some additional resources uh, on um, some of what you can do to help your referral process. Um, and I want to also uh, thank Bill for jumping on and giving us some of his practical advice on how to tackle this very problemsome process. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.